Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. I'm Emmanuel, I'm a Boeing 737 pilot and a member of BMDG's tech team. In today's video we will talk about the air conditioning system of the Boeing 737. Now, if you haven't done so yet, please watch the bleed air system video that I have published just before this one, because everything you are going to hear in this video is basically based on the bleed air system functioning or at least providing bleed air to the air conditioning system. So before we look at the way that these things work exactly, let's quickly discuss why we need an air conditioning pack at all. Basically the engines are providing air at very high temperatures, we're talking several hundred degrees centigrade here. So we somehow need to cool that down to provide it to the passenger cabin. And of course we can't just take air from the outside of the plane since that would be much too cold. So the purpose of our air conditioning pack here is to provide some conditioned cold air to the system which we can uh, then mix up to provide air to our cabin. So let's have a look at how the air conditioning pack works in the 737. Basically we have two sources of air that are going towards the system here. One is the bleed air that's being supplied to the pack valve and the pack valve is then going to depend on the mode in which the air pack is operating. By default we are uh, operating in the automatic mode but the high flow mode is available as well. So air is then running from the uh, pack valve into the uh, system to call it that way and we then have a hot air mix valve and a cold air mix valve. Now how's that working? We have run air coming in through those uh, intakes you can see just in front of the wings and that is cold air from the outside. That air is flowing into the uh, air cycle machine as well as directly to the cold air mix valve. Now let's first look at the um, air going into the cold air mix valve. Basically the uh, automatic temperature controller is going to uh, adjust the cold air mix valve to have a certain amount of cold air flowing through and mixing straight away with the um, hot air. Then we have this mixed air is going to the hot air mix valve and from there flowing onwards into the mixing chamber. Now I'll get to that in a moment. Then we have our ram air going into the air cycle machine. Now what's going on here is that basically our air is going to um, flow into the um, water separator so water is removed from the uh, outside air and then it's flowing on into the mixing chamber. In the mixing chamber we are then mixing the cold air that we've gotten from the outside with the already pre-cooled air of the mixed air from the uh, bleed system and the um, cold air from the ram air system that we have mixed earlier on. Now, this is flowing onwards and being mixed in the mixing chamber. So now we have a combination of cooled air from the air cycle machine, as well as pre-cooled, but still hot air from the um, automatic temperature controller and the hot air mix valve, as well as the cold air mix valve. And this is basically providing conditioned air, which is then flowing into the mix manifold system. Now let's have a look at that. And here we go. So now we're getting this air from the packs into the mix manifold and then here we are combining air from the left pack as well as from the right pack and the ground preconditioned air source can also be connected directly to the mix manifold but we'll get to that later. So basically we're getting air from the left pack and from the right pack into the mix manifold. Just before it reaches the mix manifold the left pack is providing air directly towards the flight deck. Now the flight deck does not need all of the air that the left pack can provide, so a minority of the left pack air is being routed to the flight deck 
and the rest of it is going into the mix manifold where it mixes with the right pack. From the mix manifold then, w the air is routed directly to the sidewall risers in the cabin. So basically it's routed to the cabin and um, over there the uh, cab air in the cabin is distributed directly to the passengers. Air from the cabin is being filtered through the um, paper filters. Now, you might have heard of those when airlines resumed service after the initial lockdowns in the corona pandemic. And the filters here is basically what's removing viruses and bacteria as good as possible. Before then, this same air is being routed back into the mix manifold through the recirculation fans. Now the recirculation fan you can uh, control up here, which is basically this one, and on the longer bodied airplanes, the 8 and 900, you have a second recirculation fan here as well. We'll look at that in the system schematic in a moment. So as you can imagine, the operation of the recirculation fan is providing air from the cabin back into the mix manifold, and therefore operating the recirculation fan is going to reduce the load of the air conditioning packs, and therefore the amount of bleed air required for them, and therefore it is going to reduce your overall fuel consumption. Now, this is easy, isn't it? Well, let's make it a bit more complex. Let's have a look at the longer bodied airplane types, the 737, 800 and the 900. When looking at the air conditioning pack schematic, you are going to notice that there is a slight difference over here in that we have the trim air system. Now, the trim air system is being operated from the right hand side of the manifold. So, left bleed air coming through the isolation valve can flow directly towards the trim air system and is being mixed with the right system air as we can see over here and the right bleed air system is going to flow into the trim air system as well. Now, let's have a look into what the trim air system is actually going to do then. Also note that we have our standby pack temperature control valve over here, which is slightly different from the smaller body types as well. So looking into the air conditioning distribution schematic then, again in the 800 and 900 that is a little bit more complex than in the smaller types, but let's get into it. You will see that after all it is not that hard. So. We have our left pack and right pack and the ground preconditioned air over here, as we saw in the 7, 3, 7, uh, 6 and 700s. And from here air is going into the mix manifold and as you can see the left pack air is going to the flight deck once again. Now from the mix manifold we have our air going towards the um, supplies in the cabin, but there is one intervention before that and that is our trim air system. Now, there is hot air being taken straight from the bleed air system before the packs, and that is routed into the trim air pressure regulator and shutoff valve, which is basically being controlled by the trim air switch that you will find on the 7378 and 900. So, note that the um, air conditioning panel up here, we are seeing a 700 right now in our simulator, and the 800 is going to look a little bit different quite a bit different actually. Anyway, so our trim air system then has trim air modulating valves for each of the uh, different supply ducts before air is actually going to the uh, passenger cabin and the flight deck. So what we're doing here, we have cold air coming from the packs into the mix manifold, flowing towards the cabin, and then we're mixing this cold air with some of the hot air that we've taken from the bleed air system through the trim air system and we're mixing this hot air back into the uh, cold air from the mix manifold to heat the air up a little bit and to therefore relieve the air conditioning system further from a uh, load. So we take the cold air from the packs and mix it with the uh, hot trim air that's taken prior to the packs from the system before we then actually route it into the passenger cabin. Note as well that we have two recirculation fans over here in the 737, 8 and 900s, which are providing air back to the mix manifold.
So, let's talk a little bit about the different um, modes of operation and how it all works That now that we have seen the um, overall system and how the overall system is uh, being made. So, the um, flow of bleed air from the main bleed duct through each air conditioning pack is controlled by the respective pack valves, as we have seen in the schematic earlier on. Normally, the left pack uses bleed air from engine number one, and the right pack uses bleed air from engine number two. And the packs have two modes of operation. Basically, we have auto, which kind of is the normal mode, but it can automatically regulate into high flow, provided that um, all of a sudden one pack is no longer operating. So, during normal flight, with both air conditioning packs which is set to auto, both engines operating, and both engine bleeds which is set to on, the packs provide normal airflow to maintain necessary ventilation, but if the air conditioning pack switches are set to high, the packs provide high airflow to increase ventilation. Now, things are getting a little bit complex here. When the aircraft is not on the ground and the flaps are up, so you're flying with the flaps retracted, and both air conditioning pack switches are set to auto, and the engine bleed air switches are both set to on. If one pack fails, or one engine fails, or a pack switch is set to off, the remaining pack will automatically switch to high airflow. So that's the conditions. In flight, with the flaps up, if any failure occurs, like an engine fails, or one pack fails, or a pack is manually switched off by a pilot, then the other one is automatically going into high airflow. Now, the um, engines are um, easily able to support a pack in high flow. However, when the APU is operating and the APU bleed switch is set to on, and both bleed, uh, both engine bleed switches are selected to off, and both pack switches in auto, automatic switching to high flow occurs with a single pack failure, regardless of flap position or air ground status. And also in this configuration, the flight crew can force an APU high airflow when either or both pack are switched manually to high, providing the maximum airflow of the ventilation when the APU is the only source for ventilation. Now remember once again what I told you in the bleed air video. The APU is capable to provide bleed air for um, air conditioning and the pressurization system up to 17,000 feet, provided that the APU is providing only bleed air, and only up to 10,000 feet, provided it also has to provide electricity. Alright, then the next system we have to look at is the RAM air system. Now, you will notice we have our RAM door full open lights up here, and that is basically our only indication of the RAM air system actually operating. And remember what I showed you earlier on, the uh, RAM air system is the one bringing cold air from uh, externally in and mixing it with the bleed air system. Now, the RAM air system is basically controlled fully automatically and there's nothing the pilot can actually do about it. This goes to an extent that Boeing has actually removed the RAM door full open lights from the 737 MAX because they said, well, it's not really important for the pilots to know if this is... Um, if the doors are open or not. On the ground or during slow flight with the flaps not fully retracted, the ram air inlet doors move to the full open position for maximum cooling and in normal cruise the doors are modulating anywhere between the open and closed position and the ram door full open lights may or may not illuminate during a normal cruise but they are always going to illuminate when a ram door is fully open. Note, there are deflector doors installed just in front of the ram air inlet door to prevent slush ingestion prior to um, takeoff and after touchdown. And these doors are extending automatically when the air ground uh, system senses the ground mode. Now, let's talk about how the packs are actually controlling the temperature. And we'll start with... Um, the basic operation over here. So, 
There are three temperature zones in the longer bodied airplanes and two zones in the shorter ones. We can see it on the right hand side here in the 737-700 where we have the left side controlling the flight deck and the right side controlling the cabin. On the, in the uh, schematic over here we can see how this looks like in the 737-8 and 900 where you have the cont cabin which is the flight deck and then you have the forward and the aft parts of the cabin providing uh, different temperature control possibilities. Basically the uh, zone temperature selectors when set fully to the left side to cool are going to provide 18 degrees centigrade and to the right 30 degrees or at least according to the manual they do in reality it will give you anywhere between freezing point and the passengers cooking. Now on the uh, system itself we can select if we want to see the supply duct temperature or the actual cabin temperature. Now the pilot's community is really uh, split here by which of the settings you should be using. All the manuals tell you to use the passenger cabin setting only and ignore the supply duct which is mainly a maintenance function. However, the passenger cabin sensors are basically installed in the overhead compartments beneath the um, passenger's baggage. So in other words, you may have a very hot cabin, but the sensors are not showing you because a passenger simply put his baggage over the sensor. Or you may have a very cold cabin, but you have cooled it down accidentally by setting the switches to a low position, while at the same time the overhead compartments are closed and therefore still very hot from the preceding uh, condition when they have been opened. So that's why the passenger cabin temperature indicator is providing you kind of an idea what you may have, but you may have something totally different as well. Basically, in flight, whenever you get the ding dong and the cabin calls, your first look is going right to the um, air conditioning system to make sure that you actually uh, have a decent temperature set there. Because if not, then you know that the cabin crew are going to complain straight away. Interestingly enough, the um, passenger cabin temperature is usually shown anywhere between 28 and 30 degrees temperature. And if it's any colder than that, you can be very sure that the cabin crew is going to complain that it is actually too cold. So aim for something between 28 and 30 degrees up here if you want your uh, cabin crew to feel warm. Or to be happy at all. Now, as I mentioned, these uh, indicators are not very reliable, and that's why some pilots are actually using the supply duct temperature instead. The theory behind that is that temperature from the supply duct, let's have a look again at uh, how that looks like, basically being taken from the uh, sensors over here. That this is the uh, temperature that the passengers are actually feeling coming from the outlets in the cabin. So the idea behind this is that if you have, for example, 24 degrees of uh, supply duct temperature being blown onto the passengers, that this is what they would be feeling regardless of whatever the actual cabin temperature is. Now, both Boeing's as well as um, the airlines are emphasizing that this is not correct procedure and should not be done. However, experience on the actual aircraft actually shows that if you keep the supply duct temperature anywhere around 21, 22 degrees, then basically everybody is happy in the cabin and people are not going to complain. However, doing that does require quite a bit of attention of the pilot and actual manipulation of the temperature controllers in order to keep the supply duct temperature at a normal temperature. Finally, there are auto settings provided up here which should in theory give you around 24 degrees temperature but the actual usage of the uh, auto indication up here is more to provide let's call it a little bit of a work to the industry manufacturing the paint that you put on this rather than giving any actual automatic controlling of the passenger cabin at least that is what practical experience with the aircraft shows, regardless of what the manual is saying here. 
So, that much uh, for a quick excursion to the real life here. Let's go back to the actual systems. So the packs produce an air temperature that satisfies the zone which requires the most cooling. Zone temperature is controlled by introducing the proper amount of trim air to the uh, zone supply ducts. The quantity of trim air is regulated by individual trim air modulating valves. That is for the 800 and 900. For the 6 and 700, the pack is simply uh, providing the temperature required. But it's all a little bit easier if you only have two zones to uh, satisfy, so the flight deck and the cabin and the uh, smaller aircraft, than having three zones supplied by two packs, as in the uh, longer body airplanes. So, the um, left electronic controller controls the aft cabin zone and provides backup control for the flight deck, while the right cabin uh, controller con controls the uh, forward cabin zone and provides primary control for the flight deck. Again, that's in the uh, longer bodied airplane types. Failure of the primary flight deck temperature control is going to cause an automatic switching to the backup control and will illuminate the uh, comms cabin amber zone temperature light upon master caution recall. Now, we'll have to switch back to the system schematic over here. Well, we have it on already, which is here, the um, zone temp light. And note that with the failure of the primary controllers of the packs, you are not going to get any flight deck indication. Only when you press the recall button, the light is going to illuminate. And that is indicating that one of the two controller has failed, but the other one is working normally. So if you, ex if you press the master caution reset, the light is going to go off again. Only if both primary and standby controllers have failed, the uh, amber zone temp light is going to come on and the master caution and air conditioning is going to illuminate. And in that case, if you reset the master caution, the zone temperature light is actually going to stay illuminated. So this is how the warning system works here in the air conditioning system. If only the primary controller fails, but the backup has taken over and is controlling the system normally, you are only going to be alerted of that upon master caution recall. Now, any failure affecting the supply of trim air is going to cause the temperature control system to control both packs independently. If flight deck trim air is lost, the left pack will provide conditioned air to the flight deck at the selected temperature, and the right pack is going to satisfy the demand of the passenger zone, which requires the most cooling. If a passenger cabin zone trim air or all trim air is lost, the forward and aft zone temperature demands will be average for control of the right pack. So then it's basically the pack, con uh, the left pack controlling the flight deck and the right one controlling the cabin. We also have a standby uh, pack average temperature mode here. And if all zone controls and primary pack controls fail, the standby pack controller is going to command the packs to produce air temperatures, which are going to satisfy the average temperature uh, control demand of the two cabin zones. The trim air modulating valve will close and the flight deck zone temperature selector will have no effect on the standby pack controls. Finally, if all controllers fail, we have a fixed cabin temperature, and that is going to be the uh, left pack to maintain 24 degrees, and the right pack to maintain 18 degrees, as measured by the pack temperature sensor. Now, you might ask yourself, why is there a difference in that? And that is actually rather easily explained. In the flight deck, we we just need those 24 degrees, which are going to provide an acceptable temperature. In the cabin, however, we have the heat of the body of up to 189 passengers in a 737-800, which are by themselves heating up the cabin already. Keep in mind, body temperature usually 37, 38 degrees. So that by itself is already heating up the cabin. And therefore, the right pack supplying the cabin is only give 18 degrees of a temperature and the bodies of the passengers themselves are actually going to heat the cabin up to a decent temperature then. Now we've already briefly talked about what the recirculation fans do in that they relieve the air conditioning packs from having to supply excessive uh, air amount by redistributing some of the air from the passenger cabin into the mix manifold. There are um, HEPA filters installed in between, which 
should, in theory, filter out uh, any viruses or bacteria. And um, that air is then being supplied back into the mix manifold from where it's going back into the cabin. Overall, reducing pack load and thereby reducing fuel flow. Another thing we have to talk about is the equipment cooling. So, cooling of uh, electronic equipment in the flight tech and the E&E bay. Some of you may actually be surprised, but when you're in flight, for example, touching the radio panels on the base of a panel, then these things can get very, very hot. And the same goes for the screens and the uh, other avionics in the flight deck. So we actually need equipment cooling going on. And in the uh, e and &E bay, just below the flight deck, things are actually even uh, hotter since all the computers are located down here. Luckily for us, we don't have to worry too much about the equipment cooling system in the 737 because it is mostly controlled fully automatic. What we do have up here is equipment cooling switches in the normal and uh, alternate position and operation of those is going to be directed by the um, associated non-normal checklists only. So in normal operation the pilot never has to touch these switches. The equipment cooling itself consists of a supply duct and an exhaust duct and each duct has a normal fan and an alternate fan, which is basically the, um, what these switches are controlling here. The supply duct uh, supplies cool air to the flight deck displays and electronic equipment in the E&E &E bay, and the exhaust duct is collecting this air and discharging it, mostly towards the um, forward cargo compartment, where the um, air that's being heated up by the avionics is actually uh, being used to heat up the cargo compartment, which otherwise is um, not connected directly to the um, air conditioning system. So the exhaust duct collects and discards the warm air from the flight deck displays, the overhead and aft electronics panel, the circuit breakers and the flight deck and the electronic equipment in the E&E &E bay. Loss of airflow due to failure of an equipment cooling fan is going to result in an illumination of the related equipment cooling of light in the flight deck. That's the um, two lights we have up here. And uh, selecting the alternate fan should restore airflow and extinguish the off-light within approximately 5 seconds. Now let's talk about um, a little bit of a non-normal. In the event of a forward cargo fire warning, the equipment cooling exhaust fan is shut off and the equipment cooling exhaust off-light is actually inhibited. That is to prevent the pilots from turning on the alternate fan and thereby um, restoring ventilation which could increase the ox oxygen supply in the um, forward cargo compartment and therefore feed the fire. If an over temperature occurs on the ground, alerting is provided through the um, crew call horn in the nose wheel well. You know that horn that um, you are often hearing when the IRS is not powered or when the uh, ground call button is pressed. Now, as I told you, the um, forward cargo compartment is being heated by air from the equipment cooling system, but it's also connected to the recirculation fans. So basically the recirculation fan system circulates air from the passenger cabin around the lining of the forward cargo compartment. And when the overboard exhaust valve is closed, exhaust air from the equipment cooling system is also diffused to the lining of the forward cargo compartment for additional in-flight heating. The last thing that we have to talk about here is uh, preconditioned air from the ground. And when that is connected, we basically have to turn our packs off. The reason for that is that air from the preconditioned system is not supposed to flow back into the pack and then eventually into the bleed air system. So in order to prevent damage to the packs, they have to be switched off when preconditioned ground air is connected. As you can see from the system schematic, that air is going directly into the mix manifold and then from there into the passenger cabin, again being mixed with air from the recirculation fans. But the trim air system as well as the uh, packs are being bypassed by uh, preconditioned air from the ground. Right, um, let's have a quick look into how things work in the 737-700 then. Now, in the 700, things are a little bit easier. Um, 
let's actually bring up the system schematic. So here we are in the 737-700 once again and the 600. So, um, the difference that we have in here is that there are less failure modes available of the packs because we have primarily the left pack controlling the um, flight deck temperature and the right pack controlling the cabin temperature. So, the um, unbalanced pack temperature control mode and the zone temperature control modes that we talked about earlier on as well as the standby pack average temperature are all not available in the 737-700 aircraft or the 600 aircraft because there is simply less demand on the overall system. Also, the um, distribution of the um, air basically is the same as it is in the uh, longer bodied airplane types. So, as you can see, there are a couple of differences, and it looks quite a bit um, more problematic in the, or more complex, I should say, in the uh, system schematics of the longer-bodied airplane types. But the, the main difference we have, really, is that there is no trim air system installed in the uh, shorter-bodied airplane types. As you can see up here, no trim air switch. So, um, the packs themselves are immediately able to provide the uh, cabin temperatures required and to satisfy the average cabin zones. Alright, this concludes our look at the air conditioning system in the 737NG. If you liked the video, I would be very happy about a small donation through the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description below. That is really what keeps driving the channel and what uh, makes possible all those videos that I am providing. So. Thank you very much for joining. I hope that you found this one interesting and I hope that you have learned something new. I'm looking forward to see you all again on the next one and until then I'm wishing you nice flights and hope to see you in the virtual skies soon.